testing. Can you hear me okay? Woo. Nervous. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jackie, and I'm really honored to be here, especially in a room of creators and artists and makers and movers and shakers, because that is my tribe. That is my people, and you guys are my people. And I am so honored to speak upon the topic that is so meaningful to me, which is sanctuary. Um, I'm gonna try and give you a little bit of my story. A lot of you have heard my story before, um, and if you haven't, uh, I'll give you a little spiel. Um, before I start, I would just like for all of us to take a really deep breath in. <sighs> yes. yes, because this is our sanctuary this morning. Hello, I'm Jackie, and um, I'm 34. I'm Vietnamese American. I am a daughter of a refugee. I am a Broadway actor. I'm an entrepreneur. But most of all, I'm a human just trying to figure it out. Hell yeah. Yeah. And that is going to be the theme of this year for me and probably the rest of my life. So there we go. Um, I'm going to start off with the definition of sanctuary, as per Google says, is a place of refuge or safety. Um, a place of refuge or safety. And that is a theme within my life, um, within my family's life. And that is something I wanted to speak upon today as well. So uh, I grew up in San Diego, California. Um, I was the only girl in my family. I had four older brothers, um, but I'm the only uh, one in my family to be born in America. So my entire family um, escaped the Vietnam War in the 80s and randomly, I was born into the family, and I was the very first one to be an American citizen, so, or American born. Um, my whole family citizens now, and for a long time, I uh, was underneath this pressure of being the breadwinner, the beacon, because I was the first one in my family to be in America, right? And I was the only girl. And um, in the Vietnamese culture, being the only girl, you have a lot of pressure upon you to be very successful. Um, but I found my very first uh, sanctuary on stage, um, which was a very atypical job for an Asian American. My mom wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor, something that was just like, regular with money and just like easy, not like, you know, an artist. <laughs> um, but of course, I had to find my own way. I had to fight through it. And I found my love for performing. Um, I actually was a really shy kid. I'm actually a huge introvert. You wouldn't think it, but I am. And um, I'm an introvert extrovert, but I found my place on the stage. I felt so comfortable because I felt like it gave me permission. It gave me permission to be whoever I wanted to be. And then when I came off the stage, I felt then the pressures of like what my mom wanted me to be, what society wanted me to be. But then when I came on stage, I felt like this freedom to sing and dance and be silly. Um, and so I found myself doing choir and cheerleading and doing all the things that my mom hated. And um, <laughs> so I, I was like, mom, I'm doing musical theater. And she's like, well, if you do it, you gotta do it full out. You gotta do it, go to college for it. You know, I was like, all right, so that's the compromise here. So I ended up going to Cal State Fullerton, which is in Southern California. I, I majored in musical theater. I got a BFA. I did this hardcore musical theater conservatory and I graduated um, in 2010 and uh, moved to New York right after. And I stayed in New York for about 10 years and that's where I found my love. I did a lot of touring. Um, so a lot of the shows that come in through Kansas City, like those type of Broadway tours, that was like my bread and butter. So I always lived with two suitcases and always toured. And so I never really found a space that I, I felt like was my own except for the stage. So that was my sanctuary for so long. That was where I felt the most comfortable. Okay, 
So for so long, I performed on the stage, and I thought that was what I wanted to do. That's you know what I was born for. Um, and then the pandemic happened, right? And I was actually on the road with a show called Miss Saigon, and that was my dream show. I had worked five years to get into that show, and I finally got it. Um, and it was really, honestly, so heartbreaking for me because it was like the biggest job that I have ever gotten. And we were slated to be on the road for two and a half years. And I had packed my suitcase. I, I had packed up my um, apartment in New York. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna set upon this amazing tour. I'm gonna make all this money. I'm gonna travel. I'm gonna see, you know, make tons of new friends. And when the pandemic happened, it was March, 2020, when we got this, you know, announcement about, you know, COVID and everything. And we still had seven months left of tour. And so I still had all my belongings in my suitcase. I, we, all of my friends, which were like 50 of us on the road, we got on a Zoom <laughs> and we found out that our show was closing indefinitely, meaning it wasn't gonna come back no matter how long the pandemic was gonna be, the, sh the producers decided to shut it down. And I was just staring at my computer with a bunch of other people and we had just lost our sanctuary. We didn't get to say goodbye to any of our friends. I still had clothes on the road in these like trunks. They give you these trunks to pack up like heavy, important things. I still had a bunch of stuff in there, souvenirs, gifts for my family. My apartment in New York was being subletted by other actors who couldn't escape New York during the pandemic. And so I was literally just with my suitcases floating, kind of figuring out like, okay, where do I go? What's going on? Um, and that really fucking sucked. <laughs> And I know there is a lot of artists in this room, but for the performing artists, and like pretty much we had lost any form of stability, any form of performances, any form of ways to make money, to create. We couldn't even audition. We couldn't do anything. We were just like stuck waiting to see what was gonna happen with the world. We couldn't create. We couldn't um, predict anything. It, it, it was just like, chaos um, and I personally worked so hard to get to the show that I couldn't even mourn the show that I'd worked so hard for because it was like ripped underneath me and that yeah that was awful it was awful and I still in in my therapy sessions <laughs> have not gone to talk about that part yet because I still am not ready it was so hard for me um, and I still struggle with it because I hate not being able to say goodbye to something. I hate not having closure. Um, the grief of that was really difficult. And so I had lost a sanctuary. And let's see what this next one. Creating out of necessity. Okay, so sanctuary. When we think about sanctuary, we often think about a place. Um, growing up, I grew up with a single mother. Um, I did not have a father figure. And that played a lot into how I became really codependent off of relationships, codependent off of jobs, really attached my worth to other things. And I don't really talk about this often, and I used to ignore this question in interviews because I was a little bit shy about why I actually ended up in Kansas City. Because everyone's like, why the hell are you here? <laughs> you know, you lived in New York and then you, lived, you grew up in California. Well, my, um, my ex-partner was my sanctuary and he is from Kansas City. And he was also a performer on the tour. So we had both lost our jobs at the same time. And at that time, I couldn't go back to New York because my apartment was, you know, being subletted. I couldn't go to California because it was high risk and my mom is a lot older. And so my partner at the time was like, let's come here. And it, you know, his parents thankfully had a, a place for us to stay to wait out the pandemic. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I love Kansas City. We toured through here. We were here for two weeks um, doing the show here. Like, yeah, let's go. Um, that's fine. You know, it's an, I, I, y'all, I didn't know nothing about Kansas City. <laughs> nothing, like literally nothing. 
And I was like, Psh, I'll stay there. And then when the pandemic's over, I'll just like go back to New York. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm still here, y'all. I'm still here. <laughs> and uh, no, and, and I found my sanctuary in that relationship because I, I was like, you know what? Like, no matter where I am, if I'm with you, I'm OK. You're, you're my sanctuary. I'm sure a lot of you guys resonate with that, right? Like you have a partner that you're like, man, no matter where you go, like you are my home, right? And I love that, I resonate with that. That, that is what, something that I did. I, I came here because it didn't matter where I was, as long as he was here, that was fine. And so that's why I'm here. I followed a boy, so whatever. <laughs> no shame, honestly, at this point. Um, but yeah, that's, that's honestly why I, I came here. Um, but when I came here, I did not realize that there was no Asian people. And, um, except for Travis, I guess. <laughs> but that was not gonna be good for me because um, New York is very diverse. San Diego is super diverse, and I came here and I was like, where's my people? Like, where am I gonna go? It's already shut down. Like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna like have friends? I don't know anyone here. And I was like, no, 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 no. Kansas City's not it. I'm leaving. Um, but I couldn't leave at the point, and I ended up having a really tough conversation with my mom. And I was crying to her. I was like, this sucks. I don't know anybody. There's like just no Asian people. There's no Asian community. And she was like, honey, you got to stop crying, first of all, because you've been through worse. You've been through other things. There are hundreds of people out there, millions of people losing their lives. You know, like she is a wonderful person to give me great perspective because she was in the Vietnam War. <laughs> and um, she was like, why don't you just create the space that you want? And I was like, yeah. Wow. Mom, you know, she's always right. But I wanted to bring up a certain thing, uh, aspect of creating out of necessity. Because so often we create because we have these like amazing ideas and we're like, oh my gosh, like I have this dream and I, I just like want it to, to to happen and you know as an actor that was something that I was always kind of like plugged into and tuned into was like oh hey I, I, there's this amazing musical I want to be part of so I'm gonna dance and I'm gonna audition or you know a lot of artists out there you, you guys have just incredible ideas that you just need to pour out into to paper or into your your art and it's not necessarily out of necessity it's because you have just like these wonderful incredible ideas but then I found my, myself in a place where I needed to create something because I needed it. I, I, I had nothing, and so I needed something. And so that's kind of the idea of where my coffee shop came from. Um, and actually, my coffee shop was actually a plan D. It was not uh, something I sought out to do at all. Like, it, I had worked at Starbucks for about eight years as, as an actor, so that was where my coffee experience came from. When you are an actor, you do everything. So you are a caterer, you're a waiter, you're a bartender, babysitter. I did all that. Um, and, and I was a, a barista at Starbucks for eight years. And so I had a lot of coffee experience. I loved the coffee culture, and coffee's part of my culture. And so I was like, all right, like maybe I'll sling coffee, maybe I'll do a few things. but. That was not a plan for me. Um, but then I was like, damn, like I need some money. I need some friends. I need something to kind of just like focus on because I didn't know what else to do. I felt so lost. And I began to have a few issues with my relationship. And that sanctuary was not feeling so sanctuary-ish. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And <laughs> that's OK. That's natural. It all happens to all of us, right? So. I was like, let me create something. And so that's the first thing that I created, <laughs> OK? Yes. Yes. Uh, I like to call this moment a lemonade stand outside of a nail shop moment. <laughs> Bitch, I swear to Lord in heaven, that is what I did. 
and I know a few of you guys visited me, um, but I set up a table and I used all the time that we had off on the pandemic to create my logo and to create my branding. I, I, love, I love that type of shit. Like I love being able to be like, ooh, like what colors represent me? What blah, 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 that, that, that's the creative fun stuff. Not the like logistical other boring stuff, but like that's what I focused so much of my energy into. And I was like, this will be my little sanctuary, a little tiny table and I'm just gonna Hope that people come and buy my coffee, just like a little lemonade stand. So I started off with that. And thankfully, um, uh, a lot of nail shops are owned by Vietnamese community. There's a whole backstory to that, and I'll tell you that later. But they were really supportive. They, I, I, phone, I just called random nail shops, and I was like, I'm trying to sell coffee. Would you let me stand outside? And they're like, yeah. So I just literally did that. I, Back then, there, I didn't know about a strawberry swing. I didn't know about any of that stuff. I just like sat outside in Westport like, hi. <laughs> I swear, I, and, and that's what I started. Then people started coming, and I was like, yes. I have friends. People are actually showing up and asking me like questions. And so I was like, you know what? I, the pandemic's still not <laughs> ending. So I'm gonna, I had some savings um, from my tour. And so I poured myself into buying this little, little food truck here, which has sustained me for almost a year and a half. Um, and that's, the set, that's my next step of what I thought was a sanctuary, right? It was a sanctuary. It, it really made me feel safe. It made me feel like I could pull it around and make some money, feel, feel secure, feel <laughs> like I had a purpose every day. Um, bless you. Thank you. And this was outside it, on, um, outside of the old Peaches Vintage and Virgil's Plant Shop, shout out to them. Um, amazing women-owned businesses that allowed me to park outside and would sell my coffee. Um, and I did that. Uh, I did that until people came. And not, not gonna lie, like this was, it was really hard. I did not understand the physical necessity, like strength that you needed to pull a cart. I just kind of learned. Um, or to hitch a trailer, and it was really difficult. But I really, really, really wanted to make friends. Um, and I really wanted to find other Vietnamese people and other Asian people in the community because I thought, oh, if they hear that there's like a Vietnamese truck, they'll come, right? And, and a lot of uh, people did. But then I realized like everybody was like living so separate. Like a bunch of people that I met was in Overland Park or in the Northland or different things and I was like this is so unlike uh, New York or California where our communities are so like tight-knit and close together and so I started to learn a lot more about the landscape of Kansas City and I was like wait like I think I think p this city might need this just as much as I need this and I felt like something in my gut was telling me to keep going because this was so hard, I can't even explain to you, like doing this on your own by yourself. I had to like get all the ice myself. I had to like ask other people that I didn't really know to help me. I'd never ever done anything like that before. I didn't know how to back up. It took me an hour my first time in Strawberry Swing. I had to ask somebody else to drive it. It was a mess, it was a mess. But I did it because I was like, you know what? Like. I, I need this, like I need this. I need friends, I need people, I need money. Um, and, and I felt so lost. And so this was kind of my compass for a while. Oh, let's go back. So then after that, we moved into the West Bottoms because I was real tired of moving around. And I found an, an amazing opportunity to be in one place for about five or six months where we would serve coffee. And one of my best friends, her name is Madoka. She is the famous Japanese, like amazing girl of Kansas City. That's right. <laughs> she actually ended up moving to Kansas City for me. I, she was also on my tour and she was kind of lost at the time, and I was like, I need help, girl. Like, there are no Asian people here. I don't know anybody. <laughs> and she was like, Psh, I got you, I'll move. And she literally moved here and just started working with me. And it was just us two, every single day, pounding the pavement. 
at, in the West Bottoms. And there were days where we had no customers and we would just like be on YouTube and like trying to, you know, just like shoot the shit. But then there were days where like a lot of people would come in and I met a lot of amazing people. Like some of my best friends right now came in during that time because it was kind of like this place where everybody could go and know that we were there instead of kind of traveling around random places. And so that was kind of my first experience of having a coffee shop. And so that was amazing. It was an amazing experience for me. Um, but right around this time, um, there was a huge attack in Atlanta where eight women um, of Asian descent were slaughtered and shot um, at a spa. And I don't know if you remember that, but it was a huge, huge deal for the Asian community. We were being targeted. We were being hate crimed because during that time, um, you know, the, the leadership of our country was blaming it on um, Chinese people, uh, the COVID and calling it, you know, the China flu and Kung flu. And we, it, it was awful. It was truly awful. And I was like, okay, cool. Like I'm in the Midwest and surrounded by a lot of people that don't look like me and I'm really scared. And Madoka and I were literally terrified because we didn't know Kansas City, we didn't know the community, we didn't know what was going on with the landscape of our country. And so we wanted to do something about standing our ground and being like, listen, we are two Asian people in Kansas City where we feel like we need to say something about what's going on with this world. And so we decided to hold a vigil. And that was probably one of the first times I truly experienced Kansas City and seeing the physical necessity of um, Cafe Cafe being a sanctuary. Um, we decided to um, teach everyone how to pray um, in Vietnamese. We taught everyone, instead of doing like a candlelit vigil, we lit incense because that's a way to honor um, people who have passed. We brought some Japanese taiko drums. We had people that were Asian leadership in, in, our, in our city come and speak. And that was the first time I felt like I could physically see that this sanctuary was really needed. And so I gave a little speech and I wanna kind of show you the people that showed up. Over 500 people showed up that day, kids, Black people, Hispanic people, the gays, everybody showed up in the West Bottoms. And even Jeremy and his daughter was there. And it was so beautiful. It was so sad at the same time, but it was so necessary for me to see that the impact and the sanctuary needed for this city, for a certain demographic of people to feel safe. And that maybe a lot of people in Kansas City didn't even know that this demographic of people felt unsafe. And that was a bigger issue to me, was that not only were the Asian people in the city feeling so othered and so forgotten, but that their colleagues and that their friends didn't even know that it was an issue. And I was like, damn, that's, that is not a city I wanna live in. That is not a, a home I wanna create. And I know my friends, that I, I made, I know that that's not the city that they wanna live in either. And so as I started to understand that necessity, I felt like, okay, this has to be more than a coffee shop. But I was like, I'm not a activist. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not some type of like, you know, I, I didn't seek out that mission, but I, I was just an actor trying to make friends and make money and a creator and I'm an artist. I didn't take business class. I didn't like understand uh, the racism in Kansas City. I didn't understand any of that, but I decided to learn and try. And I thought, okay, if you try, that's enough. Like, at least I'm trying, right? And so we found our next home because we outgrew the West Bottoms and we wanted to find more community in different places. And thankfully, a climbing gym in the West Side called Sequence <laughs> allowed us to park outside there for our summer residencies. We, we, moved, we moved around a lot, okay? And so we went outside for a while and then we started to really 
find our community, the small business community, the Asian community, the creator community, um, because I, I seek out people that are a lot like me, um, who are creators and who are daring and who are willing to kind of take risks. And that happens to be artists um, majority of the time. And I started to um, grow a little bit. So I started to hire artists, hire dancers, hire um, you know, digital creators. And we started to expand, you know? Um, and then we started doing pop-ups where other people had opportunities. Maybe they never even started their business. I wanted to be like that nail shop that let me put my lemonade stand. And I was like, yeah, just like park your stuff right here and sell it and then leave. Like, don't, don't worry about it. Just try, just try. Because that's what I did. Um, then for a while, we tried to make it work. Um, we ended up moving inside of a different home store called Re, and because our cart was broken into, and then our cart had been um, infested by bees. And uh, so our sanctuary changed, but that's okay, because you have to be malleable when you're an artist, right? You, there's so many curveballs that go your way, as is life, and so we made it work. Then I found this next place, which I like to call the brick and mortar. Um, I saw uh, that Columbus Park was home to a lot of Vietnamese refugees and that, that neighborhood did not have a coffee shop yet. And that neighborhood to me felt like a place that I could call home because there were so many people that looked like me that had businesses there and Vietnam Cafe is there. And I was like, I feel safe here and I want my coffee shop to represent that. I also didn't want my coffee shop to gentrify anything. I wanted it to enhance the neighborhood that I was already in. Um, Cause that's very important to me to be able to relate to my community. And it, even though it was just so, so difficult to get this process started, um, I did it. That, that was a journey in itself, but we created a sanctuary. And that's what my shop looks like now. Thank you. <laughs> it, I, I, and thanks to you in the audience, because you probably helped donate, you probably helped be at a pitch, you probably saw, bought a coffee at some point to help me create this new sanctuary. And this is really important to bring up that having a space for people to kind of walk into felt so rooted in safety for me that I was like, I have to get these doors open. I have to show my, my community that it's possible and that the Asian folk, people that feel marginalized, um, the deaf community, the disabled community, like the queer community, often those communities feel like they aren't necessarily, not that they're not welcomed, but that a, a space wasn't created for them. That's the big difference here. Um, there's a lot of spaces out there that welcome everyone, of course, you know. Uh, Kansas City is, is, is very welcoming and very loving. The community here is unlike any community I've ever seen. That's why I decided to stay. But thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but there are so many places that aren't created specifically for people that feel othered. And I said, I'm going to change that and I'm going to literally paint it on the windows and show you that this space is for you. Not for you to assume that it might be for you, but that you know when you walk through the store, you are safe, you are welcomed, you are fed, you are recognized, and that we are going to try our very best to make you feel like you have a place. And even if it's just a small little place, for a certain amount of hours per week, you still have it. And a lot of people were like, well, not a lot of people, but certain, certain people were like, well, why do you have to do that? You, you know, everyone should be welcomed. I said, you have not been othered, my friend. You don't know that. You don't know that this space was created for you. Does it say that? on the window? No, sure doesn't. I don't know if I'm actually welcome. Like, I'm not going to assume that. Of course, I'm going to want that. Of course, when I walk into a restaurant, I'm going to hope that, oh yeah, like they're going to 
not judge me for my skin color, or not judge me for what I'm wearing, or not judge me for, for anything, period. But making that assumption is, is on me. And like, sometimes that's heavy to walk in and be like, God, I hope, I hope I'm safe here. <laughs> um, and if you don't understand that perspective, that is really difficult for you to understand why I would literally paint it on the wall so that when it's not even a question, you don't have to question that. And I think that that's really important to understand um, about my space, um, that I is very specific for the demographic, especially for Asian people, because there's only 2% Asian people here in Kansas City. And that's very small, but it still exists. And when you go to a nail shop, when you go to a Thai restaurant, when you see doctors and nurses that are Asian, they, hello, they're paying taxes, they're part of our community. Why can't there be space for them? And why do they have to feel like they're invisible here? So that was our, the day that we cut open our ribbon. It was a very surreal moment for me. Um, I still have a hard time processing it, but just because as soon as we opened, I had to be like, okay, let's operate every single day. Do I know what I'm doing? <laughs> sure don't. So, but whatever, like I figured it out and I'm still figuring it out, it's all right. Um, but yeah, that's, that is one of those days. And I, this is kind of like the inside, it's really cute. Um, and this is my staff. Um, my staff is made up of 100% marginalized community. And I purposefully do that. <laughs> and I do purposefully seek that because we are not just your tokens. And what I mean by tokens is you're one ethnic person of your, of your staff, or you're, you're one black required person of your staff. Like tokens, I've been a token my entire life. I was in theater, you have that one Asian person on stage and you gotta fulfill that quota. And I'm not about that. I want my whole staff to feel like we are the majority in this house and we are creating this home so that when you walk in, you see a reflection of the world and that you feel like, oh yeah, this is what the world looks like. It might not be what Kansas City looks like as a whole just because it's, it's becoming more diverse, but the world, right? Like when you walk in, that's what I want you to, to feel. Um, and it's funny, I, my, my definition, I, I was asked to do this speech um, about last month and I knew that the topic was gonna be sanctuary and I was like, oh, that's perfect. Like my shop is a sanctuary, da 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 da. I've actually kind of changed um, what I feel of san what a sanctuary is and uh, I truly discovered this in, in the past three weeks. I had a mental breakdown because I was like, I don't know how to run a business. And I suffer from depression. And I had just gone through a bunch of stuff. And opening your first business is like, it's really, really hard. And so I, I, I booked a ticket to go to Thailand. And uh, two of my best friends live out there. And I was like, I'm just going to leave and, and, and just try and like escape escape my issues for a while. And I realize escapism isn't the answer, but I realize that my sanctuary lives here and here. And that was a really important discovery for me because when you create, oftentimes we think our art can be our sanctuary in our safe space, right? Um, we look at our art and we look at our creations and we're like, yes, like this is mine. No one can touch this. But sometimes art is not always safe. Art has to be dangerous to push boundaries a bit. And that's good. Art being dangerous is good. Creating things out of necessity and out of just like fire can be so good, but that's not always safe. That's not always gonna feel like like if you're gonna release a song or you're gonna release something, you're often like riddled with like just so much anxiety and fear and all that stuff. And that's not a safe feeling. And I remember, remembered sitting in this amazing like hotel, just looking at outside at this amazing like river in Thailand, like oh, it was so picturesque. And I, I felt like the only place that I could feel safe is within myself. 
And we have to really focus on this sanctuary first and foremost. That's something I really deeply realized because if you put yourself, if you put your safety in your art, if you put your safety in your business, even if you put your safety in your kids, your partners, your pets, those things can kind of be out of your control sometimes. They, they might die, they might leave, it might not always continue. That, that's very dark, and, 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 but it's the reality often. But when you bring yourself to a place, your sanctuary is gonna be there with you. Your heart, the things that you kind of, you can close your eyes and the things that you can imagine and, and, and your, your gut feeling. If you work on that, first and foremost, you're always gonna feel safe. And I am not one to be healthy. Let me tell you that. <laughs> I'm not a healthy girl. Um, I eat real bad. I have not worked out in like three years. Um, this is just genetic, like, like, I'm petite because I'm Asian, like that's thank you, mom. <laughs> but I'm unhealthy. When I tell you when I went on this hike in Thailand, I was about to die. Um, and I realized if I don't keep myself healthy up here, in here, out here, ooh, I will never feel safe. And that's a discovery that I made really recently. And I was like, wow, um, if my mental health is just like out the door, and if I'm not like present or even just like here, my art suffers, my community suffers, my family suffers. And that's something that I really wanted everyone here as, as creators, as creative people, as humans to remember like you have the ability to breathe. <sighs> that's why I was like, let's breathe. You have the ability to create. You have the ability to speak, to create a community. But if you, you can't do that if you're unhealthy. And I, you know, one of my resolutions this year was to just like let go of expectation because life. But I also was like, I really want to focus on health this year because that is my sanctuary. Wherever I take myself, I need to feel safe within myself. And if my mental state is not good, it's not gonna feel safe for me, no matter how beautiful the landscape is, no matter how successful you are, no matter how awesome your family does. If you're sitting in your kid's like concert and you're just all fucked up right here, that concert does not matter. But if you are mentally okay, you don't have to be mentally sound or mentally amazing. But if you're just a little bit grounded up here and in here, that's your sanctuary. And that's something I hope everyone can take away from today is that, of course, yes, I love my coffee shop. I love it. I love it more than anything. However, I have to love this so that everyone can be able to feel safe too. So thank you. And that's a little bit of me. One more thing. One more thing. I really wanted you to all, um, I wanted to bring my friend Wenny here because that was a traditional Indonesian welcoming dance. That is something that you do to welcome energy, to welcome guests into a, a safe space. And I thought it was perfect to kind of bring in the Asian culture into this and to kind of open it up, and so I want to give a special thanks to Wenny for, for performing for us today. And thank you for your time, and please come to the Lunar New Year celebration tomorrow. Um, Lunar New Year is one of the biggest holidays that we celebrate in Asia, and we're doing an incredible, incredible celebration tomorrow at Maid Mob in the, in the Crossroads. So if you have time, please come. We're gonna be educating you about the Lunar New Year. You're gonna be supporting over 10 API vendors, D the, the DJ's API, the Face Painter's API, everyone's Asian. And so you can support the community because it truly does need your support. Um, we don't have an Asian community center here. 
And that's something I'm really working towards bringing awareness to so that one day hopefully we can open a space, a physical space that's not my coffee shop, but that's something for, for everyone. Um, so I really hope that everyone can make it there tomorrow. Right. Yeah. 10 o'clock, 10 to 5. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you to everybody in the audience for not putting Jackie on blast for wearing the exact same outfit today. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a few minutes for question and answer. Um, if you could grab a mic from either Sam or Shepa so we can get it into heights so people have to count. Anybody and don't be shy. I like love yeah. questions. It's Abigail's birthday. Yeah. That was loud. That was loud. All right, I do have a question. Yes. Uh, but sh yeah, she's embarrassed. I love that. That's my job. Embarrass her. Um, you did mention expectations, and I, as you were going through your story. It's a story of expectation, like from your mom till now. Now you have a community of people that suddenly has built up this idea of you and all these goals that you want to meet and yourself. You have all these things. So you, you talked about letting them go, but a lot of us in our work, it builds up. It's like we have dreams and we have expectations of those dreams. And can you share some practical things you do and maybe maybe you still struggle with kind of letting that go but can you share some of the practical things you do to let go of some of that burden and maybe you do still have some of it and how do you manage that yeah i i'm in therapy i encourage everyone to seek therapy um but i think for me letting go of those expectations takes um literal mental stamina and I journal every day. Um, I write down lists, which help me a lot. Um, I have a number of different types of journals. I have a, like a five minute guided journal. I have a sunrise manifesto for the morning. I have this nighttime goal setting one and I have to physically write things out so that it feels like it releases from my brain. And so I really, I, I used to not think that that was a tool that worked, but I had, I, I was desperate because I felt so pressured. Um, I also tried not to care as much. And I know that that's so like hard to do in practice, but I had to think everyone does not know what they're doing. That's something that I literally have to remind myself or say out loud. Everyone doesn't know what they're doing. So it makes it okay for me not to know what I'm doing. And I repeat that to myself. And then I also say, if there's idiots out there that have opened their own businesses, I can do it. <laughs> that works. I'm telling you, I am telling you, it sounds crazy, but you're just like, if someone else has done it, why can't I? I'm a human being. I, I, tr I try not to compare myself in that way and being like, oh my God, like, I'm never gonna get that. I'm never gonna be this wealthy. I'm never gonna be that beautiful. I'm never gonna have that much success. But then I think about the other flip side. I'm like, if that person can do it, <laughs> I'm sure I could. But writing things down constantly helps me so much. Notepad, just get it out of your brain, put it on paper. Even if you never go back to it, you're emptying out your anxiety and like all the things that you have to store in here. So I write a lot of stuff down and I try not to care. It's, it's so much harder, but like at the end of the day, we all don't know what we're doing. So whatever. Here we go. Hi, Jackie. Hello. Um, so something that kept popping up in my head, I've been a full time creative producer and entertainer now for a year. I've been my own boss. And something I've thought a lot about is competition when it comes to business. In Kansas City, we are a coffee city. There are like a hundred, hundreds probably of coffee shops when you consider the greater metropolitan area. So for you, as someone who has grown and sustained a very incredible business model, do you have any advice for young, kind of up and coming business people 
specifically about competition and how you view that. Absolutely. I, um, I am really thankful that I came from the toughest business of all, which is show business, um, where you got to have some thick skin, thick skin. Um, but let me tell you this, if you're focusing on someone else, what's happening to your craft? You know, like if you are looking at someone else and what they're doing, honey, your, your, your coffee is going to melt. Your shit's going to be stale. You are focusing on someone else's work. That's, that is going to deter you. I never look at other people to, to be like, oh my God, what, uh, like I don't worry about competition. I look at other people to be inspired. I look at their success to inspire me, um, to flip it because you know, I, I am in a, a, a very fortunate position where a lot of the coffee shops don't serve the coffee that I do, don't look like I do, so I don't have to necessarily worry about certain things. But even then, it's like my customers, like, are they gonna go, or like, uh, money, like, are these people, that just takes my mind away from the creative process that I could be pouring into my people and my community. And so look to other people to inspire you. Be like, oh my God, they're so successful. What are they doing that, that is their juice? How can I make my juice better in my own way? Because you are the only person that can do what you do. No matter how similar you are to another artist, they're not gonna be skippy, right? And so if, if you keep focusing on this person, you're gonna just help them succeed. That energy goes to them versus you staying on your path and just being happy for another person's success. If it's another artist, if it's another business, that's good. That's good that they're succeeding. It, let that ignite you to just focus on yourself because you thinking about your competition is just going to like ruin your creative flow. And so I never really think about that. I, I try not to follow other people. Um, on social media as much, I go to them, I search for them to see how successful they're doing, what they're doing. Is it working for them? Amazing. But you have to be authentic to yourself because if you copy other people because they're doing something successful, people know and can smell and can taste um, something that's not authentic. Abs we're customers. We go to places. If you see someone biting off of someone else's art, you know. You don't have to even like think twice. You're like, uh, that's not original. But if so, so I always try and focus on myself, like, cause that's time wasted. You're literally time is so precious. Why are you going to think about competition when you should be thinking about your art, your business models, your marketing, your mental health. So I, I don't look at competition actually. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We've hit that 10 o'clock mark. I'm gonna take one more in the back with Sam. Jackie, I just want to say thank you for your honesty and your heart. Um, and then I wondered if you could um, elaborate on, you mentioned earlier the connection between nail salons and Vietnamese women. Yeah. And then also if you could tell us the deliciousness in the cups that we had on the way in. Yes. Thanks so much. So that, that's a great question. Um, what you all got to drink is called a Saigon. It's a traditional Vietnamese iced coffee. Um, it is create, it is brewed in a very traditional Vietnamese way. It's a triple um, filter. So it's made and brewed in a very traditional way in Vietnam, how they, they did it. And that's how all Vietnamese people drink coffee. So even Vietnamese Americans at home, that's what our parents have. And it's um, a dark coffee mixed with condensed milk. So in Vietnam, there's not a lot of refrigeration. Um, in the wartime, they had to find creative ways to um, have things that didn't require electricity, and so condensed milk was, was that. And so a lot of our um, coffee has condensed milk, so that's what you guys all got. And it's Saigon, it's named after um, the city that my mom was born and raised in. Um, and then the affiliation with nail shops is when all the refugees came to America, they needed a trade, they needed something. And, and there was a woman who created a camp, a small camp for women to do nails and to learn how to work for themselves. And that just became a family business. And it just kind of like created this, you know, snowball effect where that was the one trade that they could depend on and that they knew that they could come in and that they were going to be supported um, by, by the Americans to have a life. So, yeah. All right. That's going to wrap it.
Thank you.